First of all, thank you for coming and braving this uh, first day of winter. I think that we've had, I don't know how long, so we really appreciate you all being here. Um, uh, I'm Don Elliman. I have the privilege of being the chancellor of this campus, and believe me, it is an honor that I, I thank for, or I'm thankful for, and, and look forward to uh, uh, being in that role literally every day that I'm lucky enough to come to work here. Um, this is another one of our Transforming Healthcare series. I think it's really, a, um, frankly, one of the most important ones we've ever put on. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to share with you uh, some of the important work that's being done on this campus and to talk about subjects that are, are very important in, in our everyday lives. I think many of you know this, but today is World Cancer Day. Um, it's uh, um, obviously a very important day in the, in the medical calendar, if you will, for that. Um, we did put a, uh, uh, some social media blog out, out about that, and um, what was fascinating was we got um, literally hundreds of response to, responses to that, and I, I may choose to read one or two of them uh, to you in a minute. But tonight we have some of our, our top oncologists and their patients who are gonna share their remarkable stories with you. Um, I was prompted to tell you a word or two about the Cancer Center, but our next speaker is gonna do that uh, himself, so I'll leave that, that thunder to, to, to Rich. So let me tell you a little bit about, about our next speaker. Uh, our Master of Ceremonies tonight will be the Cancer Center Director, uh, Dr. Richard Schulich. Uh, he is the Aragon Gonzalez Gusti Professor and Chair of the Department of Surgery at CU School of Medicine. He also holds a joint appointment as a professor of immunology and microbiology. That's quite a resume. He came to CU Anschutz in 2012 12 from Johns Hopkins, where he was chief of surgical oncology division. He is a recognized leader, a world recognized leader in the fields of pancreatic, hepatic, and biliary surgery, as well as in other areas of cancer surgery. And his scientific interests are in the area of tumor immunology. He has held countless grants from the NIH and has been an invited speaker around the world. Rich was named Cancer Center Director in 2018 and in just in a year and a half has guided that center through any number of, of remarkable breakthroughs. Uh, we are pleased to share a brief video uh, in which Dr. Schulich shares some of his personal motivation and his philosophy in treating and beating cancer, and we'll do that now. I've had so many family members, friends, and patients suffer from cancer. I hate cancer more than anyone. My name is Richard Schulich. I'm the director of the CU Cancer Center on the Anschutz Medical Campus. I'm also the chair of surgery at the CU School of Medicine. My mom was a survivor, a long-term survivor of breast cancer. My father developed metastatic colorectal cancer when I was 19 years old. He passed away several years later, and that left a, a huge imprint on me and the need to do better in cancer care. Unfortunately, the old model of taking care of cancer patients is still much too common. Physicians aren't even talking to each other about the patient. I came to the CU Anschutz Medical Campus to build a world-class, cutting-edge cancer center. There is so much talent on this campus, all focused on taking care of cancer patients. In our multidisciplinary new model, it involves huddling around the patient with 30 to 40 experts in the room from all the different specialties and then meet with the patient and their family together to get the patient started on therapy as soon as possible. When I take care of a patient and I see them year after year, that means we caught a cancer early enough and we've given the life back to that patient. We have people who are very focused and specialized in all the different types of cancers. I'm very proud of the multidisciplinary approach that we use on this campus. We're able to attract really the best talent from around the world. 
It's not uncommon that we see a patient at CU Anschutz. They've been told they're not operable, and we say, no, actually, you are operable. I am very optimistic about the future for cancer care. We at the CU Anschutz Medical Campus and at the CU Cancer Center are working to eradicate cancer. Tell me a more important problem. That really sums it up, but let me read one of the stack of social media responses we got today. It came from a, a, a fellow by the name of Richard Bolin. I would like to thank Dr. Schulick and his staff and the other doctors for all their care, concern, and positive outlook. March 27th will be three years after Whipple surgery for pancreatic cancer. I feel I'm alive today because of their care and input. I will be 58 years old in two days, and I'm so very thankful for all they have done for me and continue to do for others. Again, thank you and peace. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Richard Schulich. So first of all, thank you so much to all of you for braving the weather and coming out tonight. And it's really a privilege to present some of the things going on in the Cancer Center. Um, I and the rest of the leadership are very proud to be here, but we understand the great, great responsibility that we have. And one of the things uh, that uh, makes us uh, uh, take this responsibility well is the great leadership we have on this campus, such as Don Elliman and John Riley and the rest of the leaders here. So the fight against cancer is huge. And cancer is one of the largest foes mankind and womankind have ever faced. And it's becoming more and more important as I'll show you in the following slides. Okay, so these are the top 10 causes of death in the United States. And this information is from the uh, CDC, Center for Disease Control. And you can see that heart disease and cancer are number one and number two in terms of killers of Americans. And if anything, the trend on heart disease has been getting better and the trend on cancer in terms of uh, mortality has been getting worse. Of course, there are other reasons why Americans die, but you can see that they're much, much less compared to cancer and to heart disease. So exactly how bad is cancer? So if you look at the top graph here, you can see the new cases of cancer that are diagnosed every year in the United States. And this top graph goes from 2010 to 2020. And you can see that that green bar graph keeps marching up year after year after year. And the CDC actually predicts in 2020 1.9, 1.9 million Americans will be diagnosed with a new cancer. If, however, you look at the death rate, the death rate has actually gotten better, actually over the last 25 years. If you look at the death rate for cancer over the last 25 years, it's dropped by 25%, right? So you ask me, well, you say we're getting better at cancer, but every year we have more deaths in the United States. You know, how can that be? The reason for that is that we are living longer, for one. And number two is the population at risk is more today in the United States than 10 or 20 years ago. The percent of the population over 70 years old today is much higher than the percent of the American population that was over 70, 20 years ago. So there are many, many more people at risk, but if you adjust for our age and other conditions, the death rate is actually going down as the top uh, graph shows, okay? Now, if, if you look at 1.9 million new cases, you, the, the corresponding number of actual deaths this year will be 630,000. And again, 
you can see that slope of the line of the death rate on the bottom graph dropping tremendously. So the bad news is more and more cases every year. The good news, though, if you actually adjust for our age and our risks, we're actually getting better, 25% better over the last 25 years. So again, I've summarized that information on the left side. The other question I get asked a lot is, the average American, what, what's the lifetime risk of developing a cancer? And also, what is your risk of dying from cancer? So in, in men and women, it's a little bit different, but it's about a 40% chance of developing a diagnosis of cancer during your lifetime. And it's about 20% chance, if you average men and women, of dying from cancer. That, so that means if you look around this room, right, if you look around this room, 40% of us have been diagnosed with cancer or will be diagnosed with a major cancer, and one in five of us in this room will pass away from cancer, unfortunately, right? So tell me what a bigger problem to tackle than this is. It's a huge problem. The good news, again, is that we're getting better. This graph is a little bit small to read, but it shows several things. On the very top, the very top arrow right here shows that our overall five-year survival rate, so we measure how well we're doing when we treat a patient and they live five years or longer, right? And the, for all cancers today, 67% of patients will live five years or longer, right? And you compare that to just two decades ago, it was 50%. So two decades ago, 50% of all cancer patients lived five years or more. Today, it's 67%. But I would like to argue we need to bring that arrow all the way over here, right? We want to be 100% or near 100% as much as possible. And you can see some of the individual successes we've had. Uh, prostate has gone from here to there, thyroid 92 to 98% five-year survival. A lot of cancers, we've made a lot of progress. Unfortunately, there are a couple that have gone the wrong way. Uterine cancer, for example, has gone the wrong way. Cervical cancer has gone the wrong way. And unfortunately, this is the area that I tend to focus on, pancreatic cancer, cancers in the liver. We've made a ton of progress, but I and we need to see this arrow go all the way over there, right? So a lot of progress, but a lot of work to do. Luckily, we have the CU Anschutz Cancer Center, the, C the University of Colorado Cancer Center, right? And um, I had spent my whole career at Johns Hopkins. I entered as an undergraduate when I was 18 years old. I went you know, through college, medical school, residency. I did a bunch of fellowships. And I thought I was going to die at Johns Hopkins. And um, one, one day, one of my mentors said, you know, there's a great job that just opened at University of Colorado, right? And I said, Colorado? I am never going to Colorado, right? I'd spent my whole life on the East Coast or overseas, right, in Washington, D.C. So I came out here, and it's, it, it's kind of like walking around New York City. I was like this, and my tongue was hanging out because all the buildings and all the cranes going up and all the buzz of activity and all the people that were being recruited here. And I said, you know what, I wanna be part of that. And that's why I came here eight years ago and it's been such a great decision and you can ask any of my colleagues, they think the same thing. The opportunity to build something great here is, is awesome and there's no medical campus that is moving as fast as we are moving here at the University of Colorado. So the one very unique thing about our cancer center is it's a consortium cancer center. There's six components. Um, we are the lead site here on this campus at CU Denver, but we also have partners at University of Colorado Hospital, Children's Hospital, the VA right down the street. Um, we interact and have partnership with CU Boulder. And oh, by the way, uh, we have a Nobel Prize uh, winner, Tom Check, uh, who specializes in RNA biology, who's there and helping with a lot of the activities of the Cancer Center. And we also have the best 
animal cancer center in the country, the Flint Animal Cancer Center at the CSU uh, Veterinary School. So we're lucky to have all these partners and we can do so much more uh, with uh, these partners. And the great majority of cancer centers, even the top notch ones that you can name, do not have this consortium set up like we do. And it's a, it's a gift to our patients and the ability to do clinical trials is amazing. So let's talk about cancer centers in general. So the, the National Cancer Institute has a given NCI designation, it's called, to 51 cancer centers around the United States. And this is a map of all the cancer centers. You can see a ton on the East Coast, a lot on the West Coast, but if you look at the middle of the country and you look at the University of Colorado Cancer Center and you draw a circle, or in this case, uh, an ellipse around it, there's a huge amount of area that we cover, and we take this with a lot of responsibility. Now, the, there are 5,000 or so hospitals in the United States, but the NCI designates only 51 of them as cancer centers, and, if, and, and actually, if you look at the number of true clinical hospitals, it's actually a little bit less than that, and they have to meet certain requirements in clinical care, research, education, and all the functions uh, that a high-performing cancer center should have, and there are only 51. If you look at um, the, um, uh, the, the places that also belong to what's called the NCCN, National Cancer Consortium Network, these are the institutions that actually write the rule book on how to uh, take care of cancer patients. So anytime any patient around the world gets newly diagnosed with a cancer, typically what happens is they go to the NCCN book and they say, okay, these are the presenting symptoms, conditions, lab tests, then this is what we need to do. So we're one of 28 institutions that actually write the rules on how to best take care of patients. And then if you go to the research side of things, we belong to a network called the Orion Network. So with patients' permission, we actually collect samples and the clinical data. So now, whenever somebody wants to do a study, they, they have access to tissue specimens on that cancer, and it could be a rare cancer, from all 18 network cancer centers. So you can imagine that discovery and patient care and clinical trials can accelerate much faster when there are 18 institutions working together trying to solve the same problem. So this is really, really important. I think this is very important for Colorado as well as the surrounding states that don't have access to an NCI designated center. And then just to give you an idea of the different areas in Colorado where we have uh, UCH facilities, affiliated facil facilities, or pediatric facilities, we basically cover up and down the front range and also across the state. And this is really important because not every time you need something do you need to drive 200 miles to here to get that care. What we're trying to set up are satellite areas that provide exactly the same care for certain conditions, but they also know when uh, there's a difficult problem or specialty surgery is needed or specialized this or that is needed, they can refer in. So this is um, our game plan to eradicate the pain and suffering from cancer. So we're gonna prevent cancer, and there are many things that we're doing on this campus and across our consortium to come up with ways of preventing cancer. If we can't prevent it, we're gonna detect it early. And again, there's a lot of research and activity going on in terms of early detection, because if you catch a cancer early, you can cure it, right? If you catch cancer late, you can't cure it, right? So if we can't detect it early, the next line of defense is we better have great therapies, right? Better chemotherapy, better surgery, better radiation, and the new kid on the block, immunotherapy, which you've heard a lot about and which has done really tremendous things. Of course, for selfish motives, right, I want the next generation educated to take care of cancer patients because my lifetime risk of developing cancer is 40%. So we better be sure that the next generation knows how to take care of us, right? We all have a vested interest in that. And then lastly, I mean, what's the use of having all this if you can't connect the right patient to the right set of therapies, right? 
And uh, unfortunately, there are examples where um, pe patients get off on the wrong course or are given the wrong advice, right? So you have to connect the patient with the right set of therapies, and that's exactly what we're doing in our multidisciplinary clinics. So uh, you saw in the video our multidisciplinary clinic setup, right? And so basically, instead of having the patient go from doctor to doctor, we actually huddle all the doctors and caregivers around the patient, right? And this is a, a diagram of that. And what happens is we get all of our testing in the morning, all these doctors are in the room when we discuss the patient. Everyone arrives promptly at 12, p at 12 noon, and I think it's because they're really interested and prompt and on time, but that's actually when we bring out the food. So I think that, that's, that's another reason we get everyone there on time. And then, of course, uh, we discuss each patient at the multidisciplinary clinic, and um, we, we, summer, we have a summary plan, and then we meet with the patient and the family. So in one day, everything is done from all the experts. And I can't tell you how relieving that is to the patient and the family and how confident they are in our care when we say, you know, we had 30 people discuss this, we, we debated a little bit, but here's the plan, we believe in it, this is the best course of action. And you'll hear about some of this uh, from our patients. Pancreatic uh, cancer and pancreatic surgery is one of my areas of specialty. Um, and you can just see, by doing something like this, you attract a lot of patients and a lot of doctors. And, and um, I, I'm proud of the fact that every year we can help save more and more patients because the word is getting out with uh, what we're doing here, especially in pancreatic cancer. I'm not gonna go through all the details of this, but the bottom line is we looked at our first thousand or so patients, and in a third of the patients, we said, you know, the plan that you were told is not, is not correct. That's not the plan we would embark on here. If you want cutting edge care, we need to change the plan and go a different direction. We did that one third of the time for our first thousand patients who came to our pancreas cancer clinic. And then this just shows the flow of establishment uh, of uh, the GI clinics and some other clinics. So I started the pancreas clinic in 2012 along with the other folks in the room. And then we did esophagus and gastric and uh, lung and liver and colon and sarcoma and ur uh, urologic and head and neck. And you know, we, we wanna make sure every patient is taken care of in a multidisciplinary setting because it makes a difference. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. What I'd like to do is call up Dr. Chris Liu, who's uh, Associate Director of Clinical Research. And so basically his role is to coordinate and make available all the infrastructure in the cancer center and in the campus so that we can do cutting edge clinical trials. Um, he's also an associate professor. And uh, you know, I think I meet with Chris perhaps more than I meet with my family. I mean, I, I, I see Chris multiple times every week. I spend hours in clinic with him in these multidisciplinary conferences, and it's such a great pleasure to work with him. He's a great leader and a great clinician. And then we'll bring up uh, Karen Passell um, uh, later on and uh, discuss uh, exactly how the multidisciplinary clinic helped in, in your care. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, and, and thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here at night and talk about some of the breakthroughs that are happening right here on campus. And my job is to give you a little bit of an overview of uh, the cancer that Karen has fought along with a lot of other people in our clinic and to talk about neuroendocrine tumors. And so, you know, when we talk about neuroendocrine tumors, you may wonder why there's a zebra you know, on the screen here. And that's because when you're in medical school, you read through these books and you learn about all these exotic diseases and you want to diagnose them. But the professors always tell you, when you hear hoofbeats by the window, try to think of a horse as opposed to a zebra. And the kind of the thought behind that is that if you have a patient with fever and a runny nose, maybe think of the common cold or flu as opposed to, say, the Ebola virus, right? But every once in a while, in, in the course of practicing medicine, you will encounter a zebra, a rare disease that can sometimes mimic other diseases, and neuroendocrine cancer is certainly one of those. And so I want to give you a little bit of an overview about what neuroendocrine cancer is, how we used to treat it, and how we're treating it now, and how that's affected our patients. And so to know where we're going to go with cancer medicine, we got to find out 
where have we been? So what is the history behind cancer? What about where we are now? So what are the recent advances? Or what, how are some of the treatments and diagnosis uh, strategies that we've employed previously to treat and diagnose cancers? And then we also wanna know where we're going, right? Where is this field moving to? How are we gonna treat cancer in the future? So what are some of the common assumptions that we make about cancer in general, all right? And, and what I really wanna kinda of gather out of this is, how have we traditionally thought about cancer and how are we gonna think about cancer in the future? So we assume that the incidence of all cancers is decreasing, and that is true for many of our most common cancers, but maybe not true of all of our cancers. The most common presenting symptom of cancer is either pain or unexplained weight loss. So I'm gonna tell you how neuroendocrine cancer subverts that expectation. When cancer is metastasized to other places in the body, in other words, stage four disease, survival is very short, and not only that, the only effective treatment that we have is chemotherapy, but it's oftentimes toxic and ineffective. And what you're gonna hear as a theme over the course of this entire night is how the advances in the breakthroughs for cancer medicine are really subverting a lot of these expectations that we expect about cancer. So when we talk about neuroendocrine tumors, it's a little bit confusing because the field has been confused by kind of different nomenclature. So you may hear these things called neuroendocrine cancer or neuroendocrine tumor. We call them you know, NETS as kind of an acronym or this idea of just having carcinoid tumors. So this, this term of carcinoid tumors was actually coined in 1907. You guys will like this story. I give a talk about the history of cancer medicine to high school students every year. And I asked them, when was the first ever description of cancer ever reported? And they, they shouted, this year they shouted out, 1983. And I was like, okay, well, so after I regained my balance, I said, okay, you guys are gonna have to go back way behind, you know, keep going back. And they said, 1972? And I'm like, okay, this is gonna take us forever. It was actually 3000 BC, the first ever description of cancer. But, you know, you can see over the course of many millennia, there really wasn't very much uh, in terms of advancing either the diagnosis or the treatment of cancer. And really the truly only effective systemic therapies really kind of came out of World War, World War II and, and even some, from some vitamin studies. And really, cancer therapy has really started essentially in the 1950s, 1960s. But this German scientist coined this term in 1907 to point out that there are these tumors that look like cancer, but they didn't behave like cancer. They seemed to be a lot more indolent. So he called these things carzenoid uh, is a German term. And if you ask me what a German physician or scientist would look like in 1907, this is exactly what I would have imagined. So. Neuroendocrine tumors are a distinct group of tumors that are, can really arise from anywhere in the body. And so unlike, say, breast cancer, lung cancer, pancreas cancer, where it originates from an organ site, neuroendocrine tumor cells are kind of exist throughout the body. So they can uh, start out in any one of these organs. But they are also characterized by their ability to secrete hormones. That's what makes these tumors so unique. So if you have a tumor that secretes insulin, our patients are gonna show up with just really low blood glucose levels. Many of these tumors actually secrete serotonin, so how they may actually present is with flushing and diarrhea. But the problem with that is that when patients come in with just not feeling super great, they're not necessarily losing weight, they're just having some flushing and some diarrhea, it can mimic all these diseases that you see here. And so we, when we talk about, you know, think about the zebra, as long as you're thinking about a diagnosis, you have a better chance of diagnosing it. But there's a study that was reported out about a year or two ago showing that patients with neuroendocrine tumors had seen somewhere along the lines of 10 different providers, had 20 or 30 office visits before they were ever given a diagnosis, which means that a lot of our patients are waiting somewhere between three and seven years just to get their diagnosis. And so we ask our primary care providers, listen, not every patient that has these symptoms are gonna have neuroendocrine tumor, we just want it to be on the differential diagnosis list. The incidence of neuroendocrine tumors is rising faster than other malignancies. You're kind of seeing the overall incidence of a lot of cancers on this graph, but you see that the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors is on the rise, and this is not only a trend in the United States, but across the world as well. It is still a very rare cancer, but the incidence is increasing, so we're seeing several more patients in clinic than we would normally expect. So a couple take-home points. The incidence of neuroendocrine tumors is increasing, although still very rare. They can develop really anywhere in the, in the body, but majority still develop within the GI system. And these tumors do secrete hormones that can cause symptoms. 
So where are we now? What is the current state of the diagnosis and treatment of these cancers? And so one of the things that we are looking for in every tumor type is to find out what makes these tumor cells different than our normal cells. Because if we can figure out what makes these tumor cells different, then we can leverage that information to not only diagnose cancer, but to treat it as well. So neuroendocrine tumors express a lot of these receptors called somatostatin receptors. And this is in, this is very different than, say, your normal healthy cells that exist in your gut or in your heart or in your lungs. And so what makes this interesting is that, well, if this is the big differentiator between neuroendocrine cancer and normal cells, then we can leverage it. What if we design a molecule that can attach to these somatostatin receptors and we place a little antenna on it? And so what we do is actually attach to this somatostatin receptor a little radioactive tracer. Why is that important? If it lights up on a scan, then we can better see it, we can better diagnose it, and we can know exactly where these tumors are. That's important for not only staging a patient, but it's important for a surgeon like Dr. Schulich to know where he's going to cut if he needs to. So this is an example of what we call a gallium-68 dotatate scan. And what I'm showing you is a different imaging technique than what we've traditionally done. This is called an octreotide scan, where you can kind of see these hazy images. And this is literally the image that we try to use for diagnosis and for treatment. But with a gallium dotatate scan, you can see how crisply and how clearly we can see disease. And we can also see some areas that we're not necessarily expecting. Why is this important? It's because we can actually see the cancer. And I'm actually very proud to say that Karen, who you're going to hear from uh, in just a little bit, was one of the first ever patients to receive this scan in the state of Colorado. But this is a very, very different and new technique for diagnosing cancer. So we, these new tests do allow us to see nets better than we ever have before. What about treatment? The standard of care to treat these patients has traditionally not been chemotherapy. So one of the expectations that we have for stage four cancer is just give it, to, give it chemo, it maybe will work, maybe it won't, and it's very toxic. These are not tumors that grow very fast. So even for many, many years, the way we've treated these cancers is simply by blocking the receptor. If you can block the somatostatin receptor, you can block the release of hormones, and then our patients actually receive symptomatic benefit. We also know that there's some anti-tumor activity just by blocking these receptors with a hormone. So it's a monthly injection. And for many decades, this is exactly how we've treated our patients that have had neuroendocrine cancer. Well, where are we going? What, is, what, what are the new advances in cancer treatment? So it's fine that we're able to have this therapy that does provide symptomatic benefit, but we know that that does not last. We need something better. Our patients deserve something better. So why don't we leverage the same receptor that makes these cancer cells different than our normal cells and utilize something that can attach itself to that receptor, but we attach a bomb to it? So what if we utilize the technology and add a radioactive payload? Then maybe, not, maybe we can go beyond just keeping a cancer steady. Maybe we can actually get to the point where we have tumor inhibition and tumor destruction. So I'm going to show you a video of essentially how this works. So this is lutetium-177. It's a radioisotope. And what makes this very, obviously very important and very special is because there's released a gamma ray, which sounds very, very fancy, and a beta particle is ejected, which has a destructive force. So you have lutetium-177 that releases these gamma rays, releases these beta particles, and this could be important in terms of killing cancer cells. But we want it to aim at the tumor and not to your normal cells because we don't want to inject in radiation everywhere. So with an injection into the bloodstream, you inject into this particle that's actually attached to something that will attach to a somatostatin receptor. So if it doesn't attach to anything, your kidneys literally filter it out, and then you actually excrete it. But if it attaches to the tumor, what you're going to see here is that the lutetium-177 attaches to the somatostatin receptor, and it gets incorporated into a cell just like this. And just like a Trojan horse, now it can release its radioactive potential which means that you can target neuroendocrine cancer at a cellular level while maintaining your normal cells free and clear uh, of this particular radiation. And what we're seeing with this type of treatment is that you can target neuroendocrine tumors by leveraging what we know to be very different about the tumor cell compared to the normal cell. So the take home point is that this thing called peptide receptor radionuclei therapy has really changed the way we treat our patients with neuroendocrine tumors with outstanding results. And what you're seeing here is what we call a progression-free survival curve. 
This is the time that it takes for cancer to prove that it's growing on a CT scan or an MRI. And you can see that those patients who are receiving this therapy did much, much better than patients who are getting standard of care. And these are the major breakthroughs that we're looking for. And this is a very unique therapy. And Karen was also one of the first patients to ever receive this therapy on campus. And we've done over 200 of these injections. Uh, and that number continues to increase. All right, so that gives you kind of a very rapid overview of neuroendocrine tumors. But this is really driving home the point that Dr. Schulich had talked to you about. These, you know, all of our patients really, really, truly benefit from great multidisciplinary care. And the story that Karen is going to tell you is that what do we utilize? We utilize medicine. We utilize surgery with Dr. Schulich. We utilize this new advancing technology that had previously, just a couple of years ago, never been utilized. And I would say that this combined multidisciplinary care really benefits our patients. And truly, Karen has been the beneficiary of that type of care where we all work together. And if any single one of us had chosen to take this on as an individual, then Karen wouldn't have had the benefit that she has today. And so when we talk about preventing cancer, this idea of treating cancer or curing cancer, we don't do this as individuals, right? We prevent, treat, and really eradicate cancer as a team. And if we do work together as a team, we learn from each other. I can tell you how much I've learned from Dr. Schulich just by being around him and, and, and sitting with him in clinic. And I'm hopeful that that's kind of, that, that goes both ways. But really, this is how we're gonna make breakthroughs in cancer medicine. It's not from one person making a difference. It really is from all these people that you see here working together. So where have we been? I think the knowledge of neuroendocrine tumors has really dramatically increased over the past decade. But where are we now? I think the new therapies have really improved survival. Um, but really also, uh, and this should say new therapies have not only improved survival from this, but more importantly, increased the quality of life. So when you look at the quality of life of our patients who are receiving these therapies, that's improved as well. So not only are our patients living longer, but they're living better. And then where are we going? So research will certainly change the way we treat and diagnose the, uh, these cancers. Uh, I completed my residency or my fellowship training in 2011, and we are already doing things that I would have never dreamed possible in 2011, and we're doing them now in 2020. And then you hear more about immunotherapy uh, with some of the other talks as well. Uh, thank you for, very much for taking the time to listen. So it is also my distinct pleasure to introduce Karen Purcell to you guys. Uh, Karen is going to talk about her story and her journey with neuroendocrine cancer. Um, and I, I will tell you that she is not only obviously just a remarkable and courageous person, um, but just uh, an extraordinarily strong person as well. And very, very proud to not only serve as her physician, uh, but certainly her friend as well. So thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, but you should applaud them. Don't, don't applaud me. Um, we, were, we had a place in Arizona, and we had care here at Anschutz, and we had care at Mayo's in Arizona, and we've been involved at CU for years and years, so I knew about Anschutz. Um, quickly, I was, had um, bladder and kidney infections constantly, and finally the doctor in Arizona said, let's get an MRI and see what's going on. I said, okay, and my husband had had some health issues, so we didn't come home for Christmas that year. Um, we just stayed in Arizona to see what was going on here. And I had the MRI, and I got a phone call the day after Christmas, and a doctor oncologist whom I had never met said, the good news is that your bladder and kidneys are fine. The bad news is you have a tumor in your pancreas and several in your liver. So we went in and saw him, and uh, he kind of walked in the room with uh, my record, and he said, well, um, you're not a candidate for surgery. You're not a candidate for chemo. You're not a candidate for radiation. And all the kids, had, of course, had flown down. They're all here, came down there. And my daughter said, so what do we do? And he said, well, I can give her a medication that will slow the growth down. So she can take it for the rest of her life, right? She said, well, yeah, I have somebody who survived almost 11 months. And we got home and we looked at each other and said, did he say what I think he said? So the kids got their laptops out. Kids, <laughs> they're almost all in their 50s now, but they're still my kids. Um, 
And everywhere they looked, they came up with three names, one in Sweden, one in Florida, and one in Colorado. And my husband said, I don't care where in the world it is. Where can we take mom? And the more we read, we thought, hmm, Anschutz, Dr. Schulich, probably can get that done. Um, and we did. And I will never forget the first day I met Dr. Schulich. He walked in, and we had um, our three kids and their spouses and the two of us in this little room with Dr. Schulich's entourage as well. And bless his heart, he came over and sat very close to me, and he talked to me face to face, and he said, you are operable. This is what we can do. So he went over the surgery and what it would entail and how long the recovery might be. But he said, but I have to tell you, I cannot cure you, but I can give you a lot of years. Well, that was, Mayo's gave me eight to 10 months, and that was a little over three years ago. And uh, he also introduced me to Dr. Liu, and uh, Dr. Schulich went over all the things that were going on, and I was an RN, so I knew what he was talking about. And he kind of looked at me, and I said, okay, let's do it. He said, you want to do it? Uh-huh. Uh, what did we have to lose at that point? So we started on our journey, and it was um, several surgeries and a few setbacks along the way, a few infections here and there and whatnot, but there was always, always somebody right there to take care of it. If Dr. Schulich was out of town, boy, I had his resident, I had whoever, and, and they took care of it beautifully. And not only that, they were kind, they were very understanding, they took their time to explain everything, and they explained it every time that more of my family came in because they all wanted to hear it too. And it's, the nursing staff was incredible. Um, I was very critical of RNs because I was one and I didn't like the way a lot of people were treated, and it, it, was, it was amazing. Even the cleaning lady, when she'd been moved to another floor, when she saw my name, she'd come down to see how I was doing. She was a darling, but um, they, both the doctors told me that there was a treatment coming up, um, but it hadn't been approved by the FDA yet, and described the PRRT that Chris described, and we had, we had some of the tumors burned out, and Dr. Schulich operated again and again and again, um, and we had to throw in some complications to keep him on his toes, so we had drains in the liver that, because the liver wasn't draining. I mean, everything I could think of to make it exciting, I think we did. Um, but it, it's, it wasn't easy, but it wasn't that hard. Um, I just knew I had to get through this, and I had to get through this, and I had a family behind me, I had friends behind me, and I had two of the best doctors in the world right here. And we did meet with Chris today, and I had an MRI what, a week ago. Um, there is no cancer. There isn't sign of anything. <laughs> And we don't know if it'll come back because this is a phase one study, right? We're still studying and, and we're not sure. Do we keep up the chemo? Do we not keep up the chemo? So we're just gonna spread it out and see what happens. But I've seen a granddaughter get married. I've seen a grandson got, get engaged. I've got two grandkids graduating from high school this year. A husband I started dating 60 years ago tomorrow. Um, and life is wonderful. And I cannot, if it weren't for Anschutz, I would not be here, and I've sent other people here, um, fully knowing they could go somewhere else, but they didn't. They stayed, and they're lucky they did. And I thank everybody who has supported CU, and please let everybody know this is where to go. And. You know, and I also want to add that it's a two-way street, right? When, when we see a patient like uh, Karen and uh, a family such as Jim and, and, and the rest, we feel very confident that we can propose this super, super aggressive set of therapies. And we, we, you can't do this for everyone. You can only do it for the tough, determined people who know what they want and know where they, 
want to end up. And uh, you're, the two of you are just as much a part of this cure as every doctor and nurse and tech and everyone else. So congratulations again. So I'd like to call Dr. Kelly Maloney up next. Uh, she's a professor of pediatrics, and she specializes in leukemias and lymphomas in children. And she's actually one of the world's experts, and uh, if you have a child with leukemia or lymphoma, you are very lucky to see Dr. Maloney walk into the room and say, we've got this. She's also an expert in Down syndrome and also takes care of Down syndrome's patients with blood disorders and blood cancers. So I'm gonna have Dr. Maloney uh, take over this next section and, and introduce what we're up to here. Yes, okay. great, thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna take um, a little bit different um, take on this. So um, for us, pediatric cancer is a relatively rare disease. Um, and so we are part of a group, um, children's oncology group, that's 250 institutions, and we do work together. However, our campus has had um, many leaders in these um, national and international consortiums. Um, and so we feel very fortunate that on this campus, although we are part of this large consortium, we really are leading the way in many of our um, uh, malignancies that, that occur for childhood. So we'll just start briefly. Um, we really had the first published pediatric ALL uh, cure in 1954. And you can see in the red line on this slide that we really have improved our um, cure for kids for a long time with these um, consortiums. Um, our progress to date, though, has really been with drugs that we've almost had since the 1960s and 70s. We are inventive with them. We use them in new ways. We intensify, we de-intensify, um, and with that, we've come this far. However, it's, it's really not enough. So we're going to focus in now a little bit on acute, um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a B-cell type. Um, so we are able now to identify this group of kids um, up in the green line that have really good features. And we would expect um, a very good 97% event-free survival. And so we really are looking for a lifetime of cure for our kiddos that come across to us. Um, however, we notice in the red line, there's this group down at the bottom. You know, there's a group that we know that comes to us that they're not going to do as well as another group based on their biology, based on how quickly they respond to their therapy. And so really it's prudent upon us to find how do we get there that maybe take away the toxicity. Um, we've learned a lot over the, the many years about both the genetic and the molecular. And first we knew genetics in the big circle. What were the good, good risk factors? And now we know so much more about the molecular up here, about you know, all these different things that we can test for. And so putting this all together and although we work in a consortium and treatment groups, we say individually to each patient, what do we think your risk is and how can we help that risk to be the best that we can? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the, the largest to date standard risk trial. And these are our kids that are one to 10 years of age and had kind of low risk factors when they came to us. Um, and so we have a, a five-year overall survival of about 96% in this group. Um, and really, we tried in this trial, um, and we was recently published, to say, did intensified therapy make a difference? And we, it didn't. We'd kind of hit our max. We'd hit where, where do we go now with this group that we have kind of hit upon good, but again, as, as we heard earlier, we want 100%. In 96% is not enough. Are we making cost for our kids? Um, we know that they sometimes have early joint replacements. They can have metabolic syndromes that might stay for the rest of their life. They can have, we can create cardiomyopathies and cardiovascular disease in young patients. Um, as well as, you know, these are little kiddos. We're treating with chemotherapy. We really try not to treat with radiation therapy, but we will have some school issues, neuropsych um, difficulties, some performance 
compromise for these young kids. So really, um, you know, I can show you these great slides, but for us as pediatric oncologists, it's not enough. Um, our outcomes, um, it is common, or ALL is a common cancer, but it's still the third or fourth most common cause of death um, in children. Um, again, we have some good um, features, young kids, but our adolescents, our kids with Down syndrome, um, really don't do as well. And so we need newer strategies for these kids. Um, and bone marrow transplant, also a very effective for leukemia, but does come with um, consequences. It does come with late effects. Um, and it really is a bunch, a lot more things that those kids are going to have to go through. So if we can avoid bone marrow transplants for kids, we really will move those kids into hopefully being more healthy survivors. So these are really what we say risk of our current therapy. Um, we've really reached for a broad group of these kids with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a, um, uh, the dose intensification. We've really reached what we can give, and we're not making any improvements by just intensifying the old drugs that we've had for quite a long time. Um, we have an increasing number of survivors. You can see that, that of 96%. That's a lot of survivors, and, and we know now that there can be in the 30s and 40s, you know, a very large percentage of people who survive childhood cancer. Um, we, I listed up here kind of major side effects, um, and these side effects really are also compounded if we need to go into transplant, if they relapse, if they have to be treated again. Um, the five-year-old, if we think about it, who's cured, we're really going for hopefully 67 plus years of survival beyond that. So again, we as pediatricians have to be really mindful of what are those years what, that we give back? What are the consequences that could come as we treat them? And yes, we cured them, but what did we create for them as they got older? And we really want to make 70 and 80-year-old healthy you know, people who survived their childhood cancer. That's our mission. That's our goal. So what is new that is available? And for a long time, as I showed you, the most recent published um, standard risk trial, we just published it in 2019. There were no new drugs in that trial. There was nothing new that we had to offer at that time. So what, what's new? What makes sense for pediatric cancer? We really have to think about these kids in a different way. We really are looking for a, an, a, a lifetime um, a, a cure first and then a lifetime without additional toxicities. Will it have less or fewer? We have to think about that because, boy, there could be a lot of new things out there. But if they have more toxicities or more side effects, they're probably not going to be something that we're going to want to expose our kids to. Um, so improving our outcome but yet improving our survivorship is really a major goal for us as pediatricians. So I'm going to focus um, the next few slides on immunotherapy, um, which we feel like in this last couple years, uh, we in the um, Children's Oncology Group, ALL Strategy Group, are bringing these new strategies into upfront therapy. So it's really been kind of the first time that we've been able to start thinking about what makes sense of all these new therapies and the, their av availability now in pediatrics. So um, again, on campus, we've had one of the major main investigators that has brought this drug forward. Um, so again, we have this world-class leadership here in pediatric oncology as well. So blinantumumab. So this is a, um, what is called a bite antibody. Um, and you can see um, the um, conjugate can attach to um, a CD19, which is on the outside of a leukemia cell. Um, and this brings in the targeted uh, leukemia cell along with a normal T cell. Then that T cell does its job and destroys the leukemia cell. Um, initially, it was done in relapse refractory, just like many um, therapies are brought forward, um, and really had a um, complete remission rate of 35 to 40%. And what was more important as well is in leukemia, we're always looking for, can we even detect any leukemia cells when we get into that remission rate? And if we can't, then we say that's MRD negative, and we know that outcome's going to be even better. Um, in the MRD positive setting, though, we still had, we were able to cure or um, um, get rid of the leukemia cells for adults. And also, also that was true of the leukemia trials. 
So this was a randomized um, trial in, for relapsed kids. Um, and kids, I say loosely because most of our trials will go up to 25 years of age, and we actually have leukemia trials that go up to 30 years of age. So my kids is a loose, um, so adolescents and um, young adults. And I've reached the age where they're all younger than me, though, as patients. So, um, so we put blenitumumab in a relapsed um, setting, and this just kind of shows you what we call a schema. So we put blenitumumab, which really has some unique toxicities, um, but it's not like chemotherapy. You don't have the infection risk. You don't have this, uh, you don't have all the toxicities of your gut and your skin and losing your hair. Um, then we replaced some of our uh, more uh, intense blocks in this trial. We're still waiting for outcome of this trial, but we do know, um, at least in the high-risk group, that um, was closed because the blenitumumab arms are better. And in the other arms, uh, we definitely know we have less side effects, less deaths from toxicity of our therapy. We don't know the outcome yet, but we kind of feel like if there's less side effects, that's going to be a win, regardless of really the uh, ultimate survivorship in this. Um, and then moving now. So now we are bringing it into our upfront setting. This trial just opened here about know, a month ago. Um, and so we are really bringing this drug, which has lesser toxicities in it, it has um, in the immediate setting. We're bringing it now to our Down syndrome patients and patients who have not um, uh, gone into a deep enough remission. So we are looking to decrease toxicity and infectious parts. So again, we're bringing this therapy pretty quickly into upfront settings. So we're all really excited about it that hoping with the Down syndrome kids that we're gonna be able to um, provide as good a cure rate but less um, side effects. And again, a win for this very special and unique population. Um, inotuzumab, so also another new drug. Um, recently, as you can see, FDA approved for adults with relapsed acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And so we are very excited also to be able um, to bring this in. We did a very small study in a relapse setting and we had a clinical remission rate of about 67% in kids who were relapsed. And many of these kids were not just relapsed. They'd already been through five or six uh, therapies and still could get into a remission. So this therapy is now coming into um, our high-risk trial. So these are kids that are 10 or older, and they do include the young adults. And so we have now a trial that goes up to 25, where we are bringing this in again early in therapy in a brand new diagnosis um, with the thought that if we can make that remission deeper very quickly, this drug has less kind of the acute toxicities of chemotherapy, that again, that's gonna be a win um, for this uh, group of patients. Um, these trials, because when we talk PEDS, or pediatric cancers, pediatric leukemia, although in my job day to day, it feels like there's a lot of them, it's really a rare disease. So we really have to bring these uh, drugs in first in a kind of phase one, two way to say what are the side effects as then we then expand it into a phase three. So pediatric trials are run a little bit differently so that we can not lose any of our patients and really try to give them therapy that we really feel is gonna be life-saving for them. And then I'm gonna kind of close here with CAR T cell therapy. So kind of the um, uh, be all if, if in a way that we would hope that we could get to. Um, so this um, drug, and you can see a patient's own cells are taken out, T cells. Um, they are then kind of um, activated, modified, and grown up, um, and um, then given back to the patient. And these then are their own CAR Ts, their own T cell, which then is going to go against whatever antibody that we have targeted. Um, there is... Um, this duration of remission for this really depends on how well did we grow them and how well do they stay in the body. It's a relatively unique side effects, but pretty manageable, and we've learned quite a bit about it in the last two to three years. Um, it can del be delivered in our peds and then outpatients, so hopefully we will have less hospital stays. They can be in school more often, all these kind of things that we have to consider that these are kids that, again, we're growing up to hopefully be healthy adults. Um, 
here, as, and I'll kind of close with this in a couple slides, you know, we, we are trying to grow this ability of these CAR T cells um, to, in, and to expand what we can use them for. And that it will be um, a very big upcoming, I think, in the next three to five years. So again, we are taking this um, therapy that, and you can see, really has a very good risk in, in these um, relapses for kids. Um, and really, at about six to 12 months, if you haven't relapsed, they're staying in remission. They're staying in remission, really, from then on out. Um, and we're also bringing now this therapy up into our up upfront kids. And so we will um, continue to try to find this population of kids that don't respond as well to their initial induction therapy and pull those kids out. So they have a 40% chance at that point of long-term survival and pull them out to give them this unique therapy up front. But this is changing a paradigm. This is a group of kids that might have had three and a half years of chemotherapy in the past, and now we're gonna be giving four, five months, six months of chemotherapy, CAR T cells, and potentially nothing else. So it's a huge change also in what we as pediatric oncologists are gonna bring forward and what we're gonna to have to grapple with in this big change potentially in paradigm for our kids. We know that right now we have a CD19 targeted, which is an antibody on, T on the leukemia cells. There are many other antibodies, CD22. So CD19 doesn't work. We're working on CD22 cars. And here at this, um, on our campus, these um, protocols and then being able to do both of those, CD19 and CD22, these are being homegrown here on our campus. And we really are gonna be world leaders and, and leading the stage for these many types of cars to come out for kids. So again, we're pretty excited to have the privilege of being on this campus. So I think we have, um, pediatrics has been long hampered from exclusion from new drugs. Um, it has, they have come to us slowly. We really are seeing that change in, uh, in the last couple of years. And it's been really the work of parents, the work of pediatric oncologists, cancer centers, to really bring these drugs in a much quicker way um, to kids. We here, uh, again, on this campus, are really um, have the leaders in bringing all these drugs to our kids. Um, not only in leukemia, I highlighted leukemia, but it's true for most of the pediatric cancers. Um, yeah, cur curing, we wanna cure these kids first time through, um, and we think that that will lead to better survivorship, um, but we still have deaths, and so we are always searching for that next best, what can we bring quickly, what can we bring to our kids, um, and again, I mentioned that uh, we have a lot of new CAR-T trials um, that are coming and CU investigators, again, are leading these, this for it national and really to lead globally uh, for pediatric oncology. All right. So next, um, I want to call up Wells Messersmith. So Wells and I go back, I think, more than 20 years. I, I first met him at Johns Hopkins when I just started my first job, my first faculty job at Johns Hopkins, and he was a fellow in medical oncology, and we worked together on many, many patients at Johns Hopkins, and I guess he was the advance guard that came out to the University of Colorado many years ago, and I, I joined him later. But uh, Dr. Messersmith is professor and chief of the medical oncology division, which is a huge division responsible for a lot of the clinical care that goes on on this campus, a lot of the education, and a lot of the cutting edge research that goes on. He's also our associate director for translational research. And what that means is his principal job is to facilitate all the discoveries that are going on in the laboratory, in mice, into the clinics to cure patients and take care of patients. So I'm gonna have Wells come up, and then later we'll bring uh, our, our patient, uh, Peggy Martin, up. Great, thanks, Rich. Appreciate the uh, introduction. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to uh, talk with you all today. And, and um, what I wanted to emphasize is something that Kelly had started to talk about, which is immunotherapy. Just a slightly different uh, uh, sort of theme here. And it's sort of interesting with immunotherapy, you know, it has this long history. Back in 1890, this doctor named Cooley, who was a surgeon, 
is actually mixing these uh, bacteria uh, with tumors and trying to vaccinate people to get their immune system to fight cancer. And um, when Rich and I were at Hopkins, this was in the early days, we were putting so many patients on immunotherapy studies and unfortunately things just weren't working. I mean, it just didn't work for about 100 years or so. And then finally, uh, in the 90s, we started getting some signals, pretty marginally effective drugs. And really in 2011 is when things really blew up with uh, these things called checkpoint inhibitors, which I'll talk about in a minute. And in fact, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Jim Allison, who uh, sort of exploited this idea of, uh, of immune checkpoints. So um, how do these things work? And you really have to step back and think about the immune system in general. If you think about it, the immune system has a tough job, right? It's got to distinguish between self and non-self, basically just using chemicals, right? I mean, it's basically DNA and proteins. Because if you don't attack non-self, you're going to get infections, you're going to get cancer. We know that because patients who are in immunosuppression have higher cancer rates. If you attack self, what happens? You get autoimmune disease. So someone might have rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, really any autoimmune disease you can think of, that's because your immune system is dysregulated and it's sort of overactive. And so it's one of these Goldilocks things, not too hot, not too cold. And these checkpoints are basically these receptors um, on the, uh, this is the T cell, which is an immune cell. And this is a dendritic cell and a tumor cell. These dendritic cells are basically presenting antigens and trying to get the T cell to react. And so um, what happens between a tumor cell and an immune cell is that the tumor cell is exploiting these immune checkpoints and using it to basically get the immune system to leave the tumor cell alone. Now my colleague, Dr. Liu, showed you a very nice video, okay, because he's a young whippersnapper. But I'm gonna go old school and just show you with two volunteers from the audience. Dr. Schulich and Chancellor Elliman, let me show you how this works. So <laughs> let's say Dr. Schulich, stand up, please. Dr. Elliman. Well, we have to do this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you didn't warn me about this. So let's say he's a tumor cell, okay? And let's say this guy here is, a, is, a, is an immune cell, is a T cell. So his job is to kill him. And they don't have eyes, they don't have brains, it's just a cell. Yeah, it beats you up every day, right? <laughs> so what Dr. Schulich does is he puts out a protein called PDL1, which is basically a secret handshake to tell him that I'm a friend. You don't have to attack me, don't do anything. And what these drugs do is block that so he no longer can do that secret handshake, and then now you know to kill him. And that's basically how these drugs work. They're basically stopping the tumor cell from leveraging these proteins to kill each other. Let's give a hand for our volunteers. <laughs> By the way, that's how we do volunteer uh, at the medical center. You just voluntold is what we call it, basically. Um, and so this is one of the first trials in uh, melanoma with these blockades. And what was amazing about this is this isn't compared to nothing. This is compared against a really actually toxic chemotherapy regimen, getting back to, again, what Dr. Maloney was talking about with all these side effects people get. With these immune drugs, you don't lose your hair. Your white cells don't go down. You don't get mouth sores. Um, you don't have a lot of these long-term effects from these chemotherapy drugs. So, um, and this was one of the uh, survival curves Dr. Liu showed. You want to be up here. Nivolumab is one of these checkpoint inhibitor drugs, and you can see these much better outcomes when you use these compared to conventional chemotherapy. Now the problem is we got out a little bit too far ahead. So there's all these news stories about these incredible um, responses, but it turns out less than a third of patients actually respond to these drugs. So it's a huge advance. It used to be zero. So going from zero to you know, 30, 35%, certainly an improvement, but it's not the incredible cure, at least not at this point, without some modifications that uh, it was initially uh, thought to be. So does immunotherapy work for every patient? Like I just said, it doesn't seem to, and so can we use it in sort of a personalized way? And one way we can do that is through this system called mismatch repair. So it turns out we all have an editing system of our DNA. One of the key challenges to life is that our DNA is always getting damaged. It's damaged by the sun, uh, it's damaged just by environmental factors, anything else going on. Your, your DNA is being constantly damaged, and we all have an editing function to fix our DNA. It's called mismatch repair. And we have these little things called microsatellites, which are basically repeats. They're all supposed to be around the same size. And when your editing function isn't working, you get a lot of typos. 
Basically, it's just typos in your DNA causing this problem. Well, if you look at the mutation frequency in cancers, and this curve is basically just going up, these are the most mutated. So melanoma is one of the most mutated. Now, what that creates for the immune system is what's called a target-rich environment, right? Because there's so many mutations and so many messed up proteins that Chancellor Elliman knows that Dr. Schulich is so mutated because he's got all these problems, he knows to kill him, right? Whereas if you have very few mutations, like the uh, carcinoid, which is a neuroendocrine tumor like Dr. Liu presented, um, the immune system doesn't, isn't really gonna be able to figure out that that is a foreigner, that you're supposed to kill that, okay? And what microsatellite instability does, so when you have this editing, it turns this relatively uh, immune-resistant tumor into an immune-sensitive tumor because you have 20-fold more mutations. And this is what happened with Peggy, and we'll tell you her story in just a minute. This is called a waterfall plot. Basically, if you're a patient, you want to be here. It seems kind of weird. It's like, wait a minute, I want to be the heart bell graph. No, you want to be a low bar graph here because this just means that your tumor shrunk. And this was one of the first uh, trials of checkpoint inhibitors in these mismatch repair deficient either colon tumors or non-colon tumors. And to their surprise, uh, these drugs don't generally work in colon, but with this, with this small subset of this editing defects, suddenly we had these really nice responses in this mismatch repair deficient subgroup. And in fact, if you looked across multiple tumor types, so this is ampullary cancer, bile duct cancer, colon cancer, endometrial gastroesophageal, neuroendocrine osteosarcoma, pancreas, prostate, if you looked really across any of them, any of them that had this mismatch repair defect responded to these drugs. So it didn't matter where your tumor came from, what it mattered is whether or not it had this DNA defect, this editing defect. And so this was actually the first, what they call tumor agnostic uh, approval by the FDA. So in other words, the FDA said, we don't care where your tumor came from. If you have mismatch repair, you're gonna be most likely to get a benefit from these drugs. And so it's actually gonna be officially FDA approved. The first one in human history where the FDA has approved a drug not based on where the tumor came from. The other major value proposition here is the length of response, and Peggy will tell you a little bit about this, but what is different from, from with these drugs, with other drugs, and it kind of gets back to vaccinations. You, many of you in this room have been around a while, but you are still immune to the vaccines you got as a child, right? The immune system has memory. So if you can get the immune system turned on and, and it could basically track these tumors stay ahead of them and keep, and keep killing them, as opposed to a drug. A drug can't change. Once, you're, once a, you, know, you have a bacteria that's resistant to an antibiotic or a cancer that's resistant to a, a, a drug you're giving, it's just gonna keep growing, right? The immune system, on the other hand, can keep up with it, and this just shows how long, I mean, this is basically two years going by with patients not having any type of progression. And now the question, of course, becomes, when do you stop? And both Peggy and I have been too wimpy to stop, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So um, if you look across, now remember I told you microsatellite instability, uh, these DNA editing defects are relatively rare. So if you look here, you know, endometrial cancer and colon cancer are the highest. Liver cancer is like 1% cholangio. But if you actually start tallying it up, you get 66,000 cancers. The problem is you have to know that you have this. Your tumor has to be tested. And Dr. Liu and I and Schulich and Dr. Del Chiaro is here as well. We can tell you that we have plenty of cases where patients haven't been tested. So they have no idea that they actually have this extremely targetable DNA repair defect because no one's ever bothered to look. And so it's really important that we do this uh, testing pretty much universally. The other thing is if you take two drugs, so this, this, these are two different checkpoints. So now think of Dr. Schulich with two hands, friendly handshake and trying to basically get both of those blocked, you now increase the response rate to 55%. And again, you get these very nice responses. So we went from 30% to 55% by combining drugs. Of course, you do get some more side effects. What are the major side effects of these drugs? Autoimmune diseases. So for patients who have a history of rheumatoid arthritis, if they've had a liver transplant or some kind of thing where stimulating the immune system could be a bad thing, you know, we can run into trouble um, on that. So what are some of the studies going on in our surgical oncology um, division? And Dr. Del Chiaro is head of the surgical oncology. Please give us a wave, Dr. Del Chiaro. 
So this is coming out of his division. Uh, Dr. McCarter has combined um, ATRA, which uh, decreases immune suppressor cells. So you actually have these cells that are trying to suppress the immune system. And he's combining that with one of the drugs I mentioned earlier called uh, ipilimumab um, in melanoma and um, actually had funding from the National Cancer Institute to do that trial. This guy, I don't know this guy. Lou, yeah, Chris Lou, oh, there he is. So Dr. Lou has also done a combination study. This one's looking at a small molecule called bidimetinib, one of these uh, checkpoint inhibitors, pembrolizumab, and a drug that probably has immune effects and interferes with blood vessel growth called bevacizumab. And he has a very nice trial combining all three of these, um, funded by a grant that's worth over a million dollars from the National Cancer Institute, um, as well as other, other uh, sources of support. So we actually actively putting patients on this trial now. The difference is these are taking the group that has a normal editing function. So what we're trying to do is see if we can change the patients who, uh, the, that small subset of that really nice response. Maybe we can do it for the other 96% of patients. And so that was what this trial is after. Dr. Maloney mentioned CAR T cells. Um, just to emphasize, um, thanks to the support of uh, philanthropy and Chancellor Elliman, we actually can make CAR T cells on this campus. We're not ordering them from somewhere else. We can actually make them here. And Dr. Wilkie um, is doing CAR T cells for sarcoma. So, so far CAR T cells have been used for leukemia, lymphoma, that type of thing. They haven't been used in what we call solid tumors like sarcoma. And Dr. Wilkie's doing a trial there. And we're also doing some interesting things of actually injecting RNA to encode um, to try to block these, uh, these immune checkpoints uh, as well. Dr. Jimeno is leading uh, that effort. So after decades of trying various strategies to harness the immune system, we finally have these, these victories. You know, when it works, it's wonderful, but it only works about a third of the time, so we've got to try to get it to work better. We have success across multiple cancers. There really has never been a class of drugs that has worked against so many tumor types. Um, it's truly revolutionary. But the advantage, but the, unfortunately, most patients are not cured, so we really have to think about that. We've got a really good immuno, immuno, immunology science here, and there's a lot of really good clinical trials going on as well. And just to emphasize, when we normally, um, if you're a normal patient being some, seen somewhere, and you want to have access to a drug, first you have the laboratory work that goes into it. Then we do a phase one trial. Phase one trial just means, um, usually means any tumor type, and you're trying different doses, and trying to see how the drug is, is basically metabolized. Then we go to phase two, which is usually one dose, one schedule, one tumor type. So you're gonna say, let's treat 50 lung cancer patients, let's treat 50 colon cancer patients, just get a sense of whether or not we wanna spend the 50 to 100 million dollars to do this trial, which would be a randomized trial, where half the patients don't get the drug, usually. Now sometimes that's a good thing. Remember, half of phase three trials fail. So actually half the time it's better to be in the control group because you're getting some side effects without anything. Um, but those are the big trials that show you whether or not something works. Then you apply for FDA approval and you finally have patient access, okay? What we're trying to do is give patients access really from the get-go. So we have a very active phase one trial here and um, you'll hear from Peggy in a minute about how we are able to access these drugs long before they're approved, actually over two years before they are approved, we were able to access these. Um, phase two trials and even phase three trials, we're able to um, bring these back because it takes a couple years to get these things uh, FDA approved, even if you have some initial signal of efficacy. And so what we're trying to do is make sure we have an active trials program so that patients have access to these things. Some of the drugs, we don't know if they're gonna work, but at least you have access, you have the option. If you wanna try some type of new immunotherapy, we're gonna do our best to make sure you can try it. So thank you, and I'll call up our, our guests. So this is uh, Peggy Martin. Actually, Peggy, you just want to have a seat here, and I think we have a mic right behind Dr. Schulich. And her husband, Max, is sitting there in the front row. Um, and uh, Peggy actually and I, we met um, initially back in 2014, if I'm not mistaken, okay. after you had had a, a colon resection. And um, they didn't, did a scan and found out that you had liver metastases. And I think you met this country surgeon named Richard Schulich. Yeah. Why don't you take it from there? Well, actually, um, I, I was diagnosed with stage four and I was given 
Um, I think it was six weeks to six months, something like that. And um, a friend of mine had survived melanoma for you know over a decade on with the same prognosis at one point. And I asked her what to do, and she said, "Roll up your sleeves and you know throw cast a wide net." Oh, do you really have to turn it on? Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> now you're exposed. Oh, so. dear. No. Okay. Um, anyway, long story short, the cast of that, everybody said, um, you know, this was friends of friends of friends across the country, and they said, well, um, you really should just go to see you. There's two wonderful men there, Dr. Schulich and Dr. Messerschmidt. And that'll make me cry that I'm sitting between them right now. Um, anyway, so I came here, and I had, didn't have much hope, and then when I got here, there was so much hope, and both of them said they didn't really, we didn't know, obviously, how it was going to go, but the hope was not only in that there might be a treatment, but if there wasn't a treatment, I was still going to be taken care of, and I would be led down the road to wherever I was going to go, and that was a really important part, <clears throat> excuse me, of, um, you know, just being here. And I also, when I met um, Wells, it was, we started talking about stage four colon cancer, and by the end of the conversation, we were talking about what it was like to put micro machines together Christmas Eve, um, you know, for your children the next morning, which he was going home to do. Um, if anybody's done it, it's a terrible process. Um, but I love that we could talk about stage four colon cancer and putting together toys in the same, same meeting. Um, so I think, you know, my biggest, and um, where are you? you? You, you know, Wells and I looked at each other and said, well, you covered it. <laughs> so thank you, and, and, you know, I'm just so glad you're doing, doing so well. Um, uh, but the two things I was thinking about tonight was the hope part, which I just explained, but also... Um, there's a book called Big, Big Magic that I don't know if people are aware of, but it's sort of catching ideas and um, helping, you know, knowing when to jump on the bandwagon and knowing when to take a chance. And they, they both took a chance on me, and I know they did, and we talked about it, and they said, most people have said we shouldn't do this. And we did do it, and that was surgery. We went through chemo and radiation. We were trying to get to liver resection, which we did get to, which ultimately the disease came back. And um, Wills, Wills and I were talking about this, and he remembers calling me. I don't remember it. I must have blocked it, blocked it out. But um, I, I knew there was, there was hope, and, and he had gone, this is like where big magic happens, he had gone to, well, you tell the story. Oh, sure. So uh, <laughs> story. I was actually at a Boy Scout meeting, of all things, and a uh, friend of mine called me and said, hey, um, we're interested in doing a study with you because we have had a response in a, a microsatellite unstable colon cancer, which is what she had. And it turned out we couldn't really do the trial, but I said, well, that's interesting. They're telling me they had a response. I haven't heard of anyone having a response before. And this is a, over two years prior to the drug being approved. But we had a very similar drug uh, to the one that they were doing the trial on. And so I called her and I said, hey, I've heard these rumors at the time. It, was kind of, it wasn't published for quite a while um, that they're seeing responses to this, to this drug. Do you want to try to get on one, kind of a sister drug, basically, that we have here? And you were one of the first patients put on a drug. It's now known as a tezolizumab. It's FDA approved, very successful drug. At the time, it just had a couple numbers. Um, and Dr. Liu was part of that, that study as well and, and probably remembers opening it. And this is back in sort of 2015 timeframe. And um, lo and behold, she, she had this incredible response. And um, uh, it, was, it was actually nice to see that two years later the drug got approved, but I'm not sure you would have made it two years if we hadn't been able to um, you know, try right. this immunotherapy. And Dr. Schulich, maybe you can talk a little bit about the surgery, because initially she was told she was unresectable, right. and you had figured out the staged approach. I don't know if you want to maybe yeah. talk about that for a minute. Yeah, so when, first of all, before we go there, so um, I know you remember this, and my wife's in the audience, but it's, as I said before, a two-way street. Peggy was my 
youngest son's high school guidance counselor and career counselor. And he's and, done very well. And, 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 and congratulations, he's in college. So thank you. <laughs> but when I, when I first met Peggy, um, we discussed, we laid out all the various options, and I said, you know what, this one is the most aggressive. I think this is the one we should embark on, but it's going to be a multi-staged uh, thing, as, as uh, we've talked about before. And I actually find this pretty common, um, that a lot of patients get referred to us and to me, and um, if, if we take the time to explain, look, it's going to take this, 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 this. It's not going to all be roses. There'll be setbacks here and there, and you set up the expectations properly. And uh, you know, you're forthright about all the different things. A lot of our patients say, you know what? They didn't tell me that this was possible. I didn't know we could do this. And, but we embarked on a, a very aggressive set of uh, therapies, and the first step of it was really surgeries. Um, it, uh, combining ablation, uh, where you stick a probe into the liver under sonar-like guidance, like a submarine has, and you basically put that uh, probe in the middle of the tumor that you want to burn, and you burn it, just like a microwave uh, burns your food. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and the second stage of this was to actually go in and cut the other ones out with traditional surgery. And surgery of the liver can be quite complicated, uh, as, as many other types of surgery. But in, in the back of our minds, we knew that, you know, this may not cure you, and it didn't, actually, because uh, we saw the tumor come back. But what it does is it resets the clock, so the clock starts over, and during that time... I forgot, you used that terminology, and that was, it was getting to reset the clock. Yeah. And that was a, that was a worse, it, it, that seemed a more attainable goal than being cured, you know, just, just yeah. once, the next right step. And resetting that clock was invaluable because it gave you access to this new approach uh, that Dr. Messersmith is talking about. So by resetting the clock, it gave you time to get onto this new experimental therapy. And the fact that we were one of few centers running these clinical trials, it gave you access two to three years ahead of time when the rest of the US population had access. And um, I, I consider this a huge, huge success story. Thank you. And I would say a couple of things too. One is just your courage through this whole thing. I mean, I remember when I told you that the tumor was back and we'd have to think about trials and you were just like, oh, that must be a hard phone call for you to make. Because like, you were more worried about me than you, like a guidance counselor would be, I suppose. That's why your son has been so successful. Um, the second thing is we, you know, we don't know if these drugs are going to work. And they might hurt you. We don't know. I mean, the risk seems to be low. But without patients who are willing to kind of jump in with us and try these new drugs, we cannot make any progress. And you probably sort of don't remember now, but early on there's a lot of tests. Remember a lot of blood tests and extra yeah. visits and just all this rigmarole we have to do to uh, test the tumor. And through all that, you just were totally equanimitas, uh, you know, just, just, just even keeled all the way through. Um, and, um, you know, Max was with you every step of the way. He came to every single visit. Actually, I knew when you were doing well when he would skip visits. I was like, oh, she must be doing well. <laughs> And, um, you know, I know your family's been a huge source of support yeah. for you. And at this point, we have to decide at some point whether to stop it. I think we're just both too nervous to do yeah. that. It's a good decision. <laughs> we're deciding not to decide right now. But I think, you know, the, the point of um, when I first walked in to see you, and I think I told you the story at one point, there was this very, um, there was this wonderful young woman, and she was all perky and perfectly done hair and so forth, and she came running up to me and she said, are you a survivor? And I was like, God, I don't know if I'm a survivor. And then she said, well, when, did, when were you diagnosed? And I said, a week ago or whatever it was. And she said, well, then you've been a survivor for a week. And I said, okay, one day at a time. We'll just... But it was, um, but I think that the team, you know, feeling like there's people, um, I mean, I know Wells, when they have to do the test, one of the tests, they had to do a brain scan for um, see if it had metastasized to my brain, and it hadn't. But they did find um, an aneurysm. And 
I'm very thankful I have a, a niece here who works in the neurosurgery department. And she looked at it, and she was with me, and she said, well, there's good news. You don't have any metastasis, but there's really bad news <laughs> that you have. And, um, you know, part of, you know, the thinking and the big magic and having, being in a situation where all of you guys are creative thinkers and you're always thinking, you know, the next step and how can we help in different ways, um, you know, we were trying to figure out a way not to have to be on blood thinners. And the normal, you know, t to normally take care of an aneurysm, you would need to be on blood thinners. And anyways, I think I actually found this trial, but, you know, I was instructed not to Dr. Google, but I went to, this was smart of me, I went to hopkins.edu. <laughs> <laughs> but we were able to, but the, it was another trial. So we entered, I actually participated in another trial for a um, coil, a coil, yeah. a web device that um, I could put in the, have put in the aneurysm and not have to stay on blood thinners. And that was, that was been very successful. But we had a discussion at one point of waiting to take care of that. Um, until we found out if the immunotherapy worked. And that was recognizing that going from, a, you know, having an aneurysm burst might be a better way to go. And that was a lot of trust. And I really, really appreciated that. Because mm -hmm. um, that was a good, good decision. I did have one head headache one day that I was like, oh, no, not now. <laughs> but <laughs> anyways, we're here. So I, you know... I thank CU for a lot of a lot of things, and they're they're just good, kind people, and at all levels. Even you know, there was a wonderful nurse. This was the day of the surgery, and they they were doing the MRI or the CAT scan, and they were supposed to do three things. And for some reason, she only did two. She forgot the third. And I said, I think it's pretty important that we have the third one. If Dr. Schulich, we couldn't get a hold of Dr. Schulich. I call her Minnesota because she was about this big and had a Minnesota accent. And she said, I'm going to take care of it for you. And she went off. And so that was, you know, who, I, don't, I think she was an LPN. Or I don't know what, she, what their name. But that is so true, though. I mean, it is a team thing. The levels. nurses it's, and the pharmacists oh and the schedulers and the MAs who take your vitals. It's all part of the same team. And they're team, friends. So. They're, I mean, I've been here. I've, it's um, five years that I've been on the, the trial. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. What, I, what I thought we would do is have our uh, patients and father uh, come up, Kevin, Karen, if you can come up, and we have time for questions and answers from the audience. So if there's something you want to address with the patients, or uh, Kevin, the, the, the patient's father, or the doctors, feel free to ask. I'm gonna give up my seat here. You're okay? Yeah. Okay. Any, any questions? Yes, please. BRCA or BRCA. So it actually um, brings up a couple interesting points, but it turns out BRCA is actually a totally different, um, another inherited predisposition. You know, I think of cancer as the intersection of three things. One is your family risk, the second is the environment, and the third, and probably most important, is luck. You know, in some ways, cancer is just like watching a slow car accident or something. You know, it's, it's one, a lot of it is luck. But there are probably over a million Americans walking around with inherited cancer syndromes. Lynch syndrome is, uh, is what is listed for these editing problems that you have. But BRCA also has similar issues. It turns out it, it, BRCA is involved in a different type of, uh, of, of DNA repair when DNA is being uh, divided. And so patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, BRCA1 is actually quite common for uh, pancreatic cancer and many other cancer types, and BRCA2 common also for, uh, for uh, breast cancer and ovarian cancer and that type of thing. 
So um, again, this is another big investment made by Chancellor Elliman into our personalized, and UC Health into our personalized uh, medicine. Um, and basically what's happening is people are being consented to test their blood. And we've tested over 30,000 patients. Uh, Don, it might even be more, 50,000? Yeah, he's saying up. So um, I'm gonna get whacked with the T cell <laughs> myself here. So, so basically um, over 50,000 patients and we've picked up roughly 400 to 600 cases of inherited genetic syndromes and we've had to hire more genetic counselors to sort of help people sort through that. Um, because if there's a million people walking around in this country who have an inherited syndrome or if we did screening, we could prevent cancer prevent it from ever coming up. Um, Dr. Schulich has a high-risk pancreas cancer patient for people with BRCA1, for instance, and Cheryl McGee, who I can tell you is kind of the glue to the whole thing, the secret sauce. Cheryl runs that clinic, and there's a lot of scans and extra things that we do. Um, so um, when we find these genetic issues, we have to find out whether it's in your blood or it's just in the tumor. If it's just in the tumor, we don't worry about it. You probably didn't inherit it. But if it's in your blood, we need to start thinking about talking to your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, your parents, your kids. You know, sort of the whole wide thing. And I often tell our fellows, our trainees, one of the biggest impacts you can have in a family is if you sort of catch that rare thing and realize, wait a minute, this family might have a rare genetic thing going on. Uh, maybe I should refer them to a genetic counselor. And more and more, we're actually doing, uh, we're basically blanketing and doing germline genetic testing for every patient who walks in the door with pancreatic cancer. And we're doing tumor profiling. Uh, but Dr. Element, uh, Don Elliman can tell you that took tens of millions of dollars to set up and um, has been a, a, you know, a big push here to get that personalized medicine. And, and the other thing I want, I want to add is that at uh, all of our multidisciplinary clinics, we actually have one or two professional geneticists who are sitting there as we're discussing every case. So even if the doctors aren't smart enough to pick up on something, uh, one of the geneticists will say, you know, Dr. Messersmith, Dr. Schulich, have you thought about this mutation or that mutation? And very often I'm Googling you know, what, what that mutation is, uh, but uh, we, we actually pick up a lot of things in the multidisciplinary setting because we have all the world's experts who know their stuff and catch things. And when you have 30 people going over something, you're not gonna miss anything, right? Especially 30 experts. Yes, please. Of all the therapies that have been discussed tonight, do you guys get more referrals from inside the CU children's system or from without? And does insurance usually cover the stuff you talked about? Yeah, so, you know, I can, so I, I live in the adult GI cancer multidisciplinary clinics. That's where I am uh, most days. And I can tell you a third of our patients come from out of state to come to these multidisciplinary clinics. So two thirds are from in-state all over Colorado and one third uh, comes from out of state. And that one third will typically come from the surrounding states of Colorado, but they come from the East Coast, they come from the West Coast. And we, have, we even have patients come from overseas, um, Europe, Mongolia, um, South America. And, uh, and, and, and what attracts them is not only the great clinical care we have, but the cutting edge clinical trials that are only available at uh, selected sites around the country and for that matter around the world. And I just thought I'd add for children's, as you saw that cancer center kind of by itself, um, we really also serve a seven state region. So for us, um, we also have quite a few of our patients come out, but we really also have national and international consults as well um, that we serve really um, any population. And I think very much for pediatric oncology, being on a clinical trial is what we would refer to as standard of care. Um, and so we, I think, enjoy that we have very little um, difficulty with insurance um, getting most of the clinical trials uh, covered for kids. Yeah, and just to point out, when you're on a clinical trial, the study drug is free. So the study drug is paid for by the sponsor. So typically, we actually, in some ways, you're saving insurance money because you're not using the standard stuff. Um, so insurance coverage usually is an issue, but we do have financial counselors, and we want to look at that because it's actually been shown that what we call financial toxicity, 
So there have been actual studies showing, and I, I have personal experience with this because my brother got leukemia. He couldn't work for a year and a half. He went bankrupt. Uh, you have shorter survival if you have financial toxicity than if you don't. So it actually literally takes years out for your life if you are driven into bankruptcy or something by a medical problem. Um, but happy to say that the study drugs that we give are free. Say that. Yeah, so all the major uh, insurance companies cover pancreatic surgery. The question is, where do they cover pancreatic surgery? That's the big question. And uh, yeah, I, I don't want to get into all the details, but a lot of the insurance companies negotiate with health systems as to can we send our patients here or not. So uh, we actually have um, a lot of different insurance companies who want to come to the University of Colorado because of the expertise and excellent care that we have. But there are some insurance companies who say, nope, we don't want you to go to the University of Colorado. And uh, you know, I, I think uh, uh, patients and insurance companies have to make difficult decisions sometimes. Very simple question. What is the main cause for the increase of leukemia among children? The main, repeat that? What's the, main the main cause of increase? Oh, gosh. You know, um, it's hard for us to answer. It, it, year over year, the uh, uh, leukemia incidence increases in kids. I, I think we think there is some sorry, some component of industrialized nation. There is undoubtedly some component of, you know, what we live. We know so much more about what doesn't cause it. And so I spend a lot of my time of what doesn't cause it. And we know it's not parental. For the most part, it's not their exposures. It's not the high wires, electromagnetic um, exposure, so it, it really is, it's probably the big, one of the biggest unknowns, and I would say, Kevin, one of the big questions that parents answer, and especially with an experience like that, you know, when, when your child comes, you know, it's a, it's a question we wish we could answer better. Yeah. It, that was a question I had, is how did she get this? And they, they don't, no, in many ways. And in many ways, that's not specific to leukemia either. It's in many other cancers. But um, um, you move on from that, right? And you try to get to a cure and get your, your child as, as healthy as possible and, and off treatment. But, but it took me a while to do that. Yeah, but that, that's why not only is the actual clinical care so important, but the research and the basic science is extremely important. Because if we could actually answer the question of you know, what causes ALL and why is it increasing from a basic science point of view, from a laboratory point of view, from studying the genes, then that's halfway towards the cure, right? If you know what the exact issue is, you can actually target resources to that exact problem and either prevent it or catch it early or if it occurs, attack it with uh, great therapies. So to that point, can you describe a little bit more how maybe preclinical trials out of the research side have influenced obviously what's happened here in healthcare yeah. in the clinic? Yeah, I, and you know, we have many, many examples. Um, I'll just start off with one in which um, we actually have done clinical trials against sarcoma, which is cancer of the bone and soft tissues. And we've done these trials in dogs at CSU. And the information that we gain there from dogs at CSU inform what we do here on campus in humans, right? And that's a great example of a collaboration between an animal cancer center and a human cancer center, how we exchange information and we accelerate the cure of both men and women as well as dogs. Uh, just to add on to that, um, it's a fantastic question. You know, when you look at drugs, biomarkers, combination of drugs, what you really want to do is bring forth the best and the most promising things to our patients. And so what you really don't want, and immunotherapy is a great example of this, there are very, very few models that can mimic the human immune system. And so 
what you want to do traditionally is do these studies in a lab and then bring the most promising, groundbreaking stuff to our patients. For immunotherapy, because the models haven't really existed within the laboratory to test this, our patients have become the testing ground for this. And so a lot of the combinations in clinical trials have been take drug A and immunotherapy Y and just kind of hope for the best. And so one of the things that uh, we're actually working with uh, in, in our lab, and this is a lab that's uh, you know, shared by the GI group, but you know, really run uh, through Dr. Messersmith, is the development of this model that can mimic the human immune system. One of you know, the few that exists in our country right now, and that's here on campus. And the idea is that you take these combination of drugs with a scientific hypothesis and you test it in the lab, not in the patients. And maybe we can find out not only is this the combination that's gonna work, number two, is there a biomarker where we can select the specific patient population, just like Dr. Messersmith was talking about, that's going to benefit from it. And if you have that data, and even think about, well, why do our patients become resistant you know, to these drugs, if you can figure that out in the lab and that push those concepts forward to our patients, then our patients are going to benefit from all that. So that's why it's so critically important to be able to test as much of this in the laboratory as we can because you know, then we can reduce not only toxicity from these drugs, but really bring forth the most promising combinations of drugs. Here. Edie. Thank you. Your progress is astounding. And maybe Don Elliman can answer this question best. Um, do you see it as a major threat, the new state uh, initiative for the state choice healthcare? Better you than us. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a you bet your career answer. Um, yeah, the, we all know that the cost of healthcare and the rate of growth of the cost of healthcare is unsustainable. So uh, as an institution, we are uh, totally supportive of, of, of being a partner in the reduction of the cost of healthcare. When you talk about cancer therapy, though, uh, you're getting into a, a spectrum of, of, the, of the care market, if you will that uh, cost um, is, you know, what's the value of a human life? I mean, that, that's really what it boils down to. And um, we are in discussions with the state, with our hospital partners. Colorado uh, and Governor Polis has, has led this effort. Um, many of you have heard of these new high-cost drugs um, that, that target uh, various forms of cancer that are uh, cost somewhere between three hundred and fifty and five hundred thousand dollars. There's actually some drugs for for spinal muscular atrophy that are much more expensive than that. And Colorado, as a state, has said that they will pay seventy two. Their uh, Medicare or Medicaid will pay seventy two percent of the cost of those drugs. It's the first state in the United States that has addressed that problem and said they would pay less than one hundred percent. So we are currently in a discussion with them about how to, how to uh, conquer that problem because you know, if, you're, if you're a caregiver, a, a you know, hospital partner, or physicians, and you're looking at a $500,000 drug and you're only gonna get $400,000 from the state to help pay for it, then you got a $100,000 problem. And you don't need to do the math for, to say that it doesn't take very many patients to cause, to cause that to be an issue. So I would say that as it relates to our relationships with, with the state today, uh, they are ongoing and there is an active dialogue. Uh, we're not necessarily all on the same page right now. But we are supportive uh, and, and need to be supportive of the overall effort to uh, to rein in the uh, ever escalating cost of, of care with uh, some form of total cost of care reduction. I, I hope that answered it without me getting fired. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and that's a great example of why we love working for him. <laughs> I have a question regarding the um, multidisciplinary clinic. I'm not back here. <laughs> the multidisciplinary clinic. How unique is that to you, the cancer centers around the country? So, you know, I, I think all cancer centers will advertise some form of multidisciplinary care, 
right? And you know, if you, def if you exactly define multidisciplinary care, that just means uh, people from different disciplines contributing to the care. But a lot of centers don't have their doctors meet together. Um, they, they may have uh, some common conference that they go to where there are two or three people from different specialties that discuss the case. I would say that what we do is very, very unique. We actually assemble 30 physicians, experts, uh, surgeons, medical oncologists, uh, radiation oncologists, gastroenterologists, radiologists, pathologists, anesthesiologists, and uh, in addition to that, there are geneticists um, uh, and, and uh, social workers and nutritionists and, you know, go down the line. We actually physically put 30 of these people in a room and we systematic, we, we have a flow. You start off with the history of the patient, um, what's, what's the physical examination look like? Um, let's go through all the tests, you know, and some patients have 10 tests that we have to go through. We look at all the radiology. The pathologist is there looking at the actual tissue slides under a microscope and projecting it so all 30 of us can see. And then, you know, the great majority of cases, it, it's pretty straightforward, all 30 of us agree, but it's not uncommon where we actually have an argument in the room where 25 are on this side and five are on this side, and we, we argue, we debate, we you know, present papers, but in the end, when we leave that conference, we have a consensus, this is what the plan is, this is what we're going to do. We explained to the patient there was some debate about what the, step is, the next step is, but the majority of people believe this. So at this level, I think it is extremely unique. Right now, do other centers have multidisciplinary care? Of course, they do. They they have care that involves many uh, different types of physicians and specialists. But what what I've seen here is really incredible. Rich, one th one thing just to add is that it's uh, also specialized. So at at most um, tumor boards or multidisciplinary clinics, they're seeing everything. So they're going to see a breast cancer and then a lymphoma and then they'll see a colon cancer and then a lung cancer. We have 10 different ones that are all super specialized. So in our pancreatic multi clinic, we only see pancreas cancers, period. And then the next day we have a colorectal. We only see colorectal cancers, and that's it. And then the next day we have a liver, and we only see liver cancers, and, uh, and neuroendocrine is pa paired there. Uh, we have uh, two breast cancer, lung, sarcoma, all the ones that Dr. Schulich went through. So uh, multi care is better than non multi care, but at the same time having the specialization is really important. And Karen may want to add, what, what, what was it like to uh, walk into that multidisciplinary clinic? Were you, were you ready for that, or what, what surprised you? Actually, I didn't go in the, the day you discussed it, you know. And um, my first reaction, and actually my husband and the kids, too, said, look like Dr. Schulich was really watching you. I said, yeah, he was. I think, you know, he wanted to know who he was dealing with, what the support group was. Um, you know, she's getting old. Is she worth doing it? Um, <laughs> uh, but, but he really was watching not just me, but the entire family to, to see, you know, what is this system like? What piece is coming in here? So there's no doubt in my mind they covered everything. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. In your case, you weren't there the same day, but we discussed your case amongst all 30 people. And there was debate, and, but we arrived, obviously, at the right uh, conclusion. Peggy, how about, how about uh, your experience? Um, I think they were just formulating when I came in, um, because I know we had a similar description of a lot of people in one office, and you guys were right across from each other, the surgery, and the, so you could say, let's go over and we'll, you know, whatever. But I, I must say, from a friend of mine who had, what's the, she has breast cancer, and it's one that, I can't remember, triple negative or something, but she was somewhere else, and she was literally carrying her CT scans and all that across, you know, trying to get from one side of town to the other to meet with the doctor. And I told her about what we did here and she just couldn't believe it. I mean, it was so not her experience. She ended up actually traveling 
to the East Coast um, for treatment in a similar, um, where they have a multidisciplinary approach. And I'm happy to say she's had, you know, to date she's had a positive outcome. And, um, but I think it's an amazing, and I know I have a cousin here who went through the same here at CU and it was a multi, and, and she had the experience of meeting with everybody in one day. And I have a cousin from, we have, maybe we could be one of those families. <laughs> But um, we do have a lot of um, colon cancer and, and abdominal cancers. But anyways, another one from Santa Fe who's come up here, and, and he was caught at stage, um, stage one, and so that's been very successful also. So we're, we're going to close with just one more comment because it's 7.30, and we want to get you out of here on time. So. No, I mean, just to add on to all of that, I mean, really, when you think about even medical oncologists and surgical and you know surgical oncologists, oftentimes they're in different buildings, literally, or at least in different floors. And you know, at the University of Colorado Hospital, we literally all have to we share the same team room, and it's a chaotic team room, and it's like totally crazy. But what you'll see over the course of the day is surgeons and medical oncologists, which are, again are typically very very siloed off, and they're interacting and asking each other questions all day long. And that's really the kind of care that you want to get, where doctors are asking each other questions and getting guidance and. And it really is a credit to Dr. Schulich and, you know, in, in really setting up this, uh, this model, which I really think has benefited, obviously, the patients, but really the physicians as well to work together as a team. All right. With that, I want to thank our panelists. And thank you so much for coming. And, and, and a round of applause for Chancellor Elliman. Without his support, none of this would be possible. And, and we want to thank all of you for coming tonight and caring and helping in our fight against cancer. So thank you and drive safely back home. <laughs>